From Chicago, welcome to Three Degrees Discussions. I'm your host, Mike Vasquez. This is a podcast devoted to the stories behind the innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the 3D printing world. We did a survey of around 500 different companies, and, and lots of them were waiting more than a week just to get their results back. Um, you know, so if if we if we look at the additive angle, if you're trying to do parameter development to get the best possible tensile properties, so you've got a laser-based system and you want to change whether it be layer uh, layer height, hatch spacing, laser power, etc., and you want to know, okay, how am I going to maximize my tensile properties? We well, don't want to have to wait a week once you've done your first print to be able to iteratively adjust those those properties. That was Jimmy Campbell. Jimmy is the CTO of Plastometrix. Jimmy has an undergraduate degree in natural sciences from the University of Cambridge. In 2014, he joined the Composites and Coatings Group under the supervision of Professor Bill Klein and Dr. James Dean. Jimmy has recently completed his PhD, which focused very heavily on the the further development of experimental methods and computer models for measuring mechanical properties from indentation data. One of Jimmy's greatest successes to date was the identification of a fundamental flaw in an analytical calculation method used extensively in the indentation community. Much of his recent work has involved validation of the indentation plastometry methodology, work that subsequently led to the development of a quicker, more reliable methodology that is currently incorporated in the latest SEM PID software packages. Before we get started, head over to www.3degreestocompany.com and subscribe to the podcast, where you can listen to the show anywhere you download your podcast, including Spotify, Apple, Amazon, or Stitcher. All right, Jimmy, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Uh, continuing the trend, we've got another materials engineer. I've looked back, I think we're over 100 episodes now, and I think there's like, it highly skews materials engineer. So <laughs> it's, it's not only additive, but materials, it seems to be the, the theme of this podcast. So I'm excited for the conversation today. You guys are doing some cool stuff and mechanical testing, which I'm super interested in, in and, and thinking about that in the context of additive. So um, welcome. And as we kind of jump in, what what kind of got you started in down this path? I, I always like to start with kind of the early days. So where, where'd you grow up? Kind of what was your childhood like in terms of getting into the career track that you're on now? Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks, Mike. And uh, great to be here today. Um, so I grew up in uh, the north of England, as some of your listeners may be able to tell from my accent. Um, so in Manchester, I studied sort of sciences uh, at school. And that's really, you know, it, I found it really exciting uh, at the time. And I, I kind of fell into the kind of physical side uh, of the sciences because I did biology at school. Um, but when I applied to uh, University of Cambridge in the UK for uh, undergraduate degree, uh, I sort of fell into the, the sort of physical uh, physics, materials, math side without uh, almost without choosing. I sort of arrived on day one and uh, my supervisor said, um, well, you don't really want to do biology, do you? So uh, I, that was kind of how I fell into the kind of more um, physical side. Uh, and f- from the first year onwards, I think a lot of people arrive here and they do a mixture of physics, maths, uh, chemistry and materials. And um, in the first year, I really wanted to be a physicist. Uh, and after the first year, I realized that math was really too, too, too much for me. So uh, I, I ended up doing physics. Sorry, I ended up doing uh, chemistry and materials in the second year. Um, and I really just liked the applied part that you get with material science. So uh, I found in chemistry, I was making a lot of white powders from uh, from different clear liquids, for example. Uh, and I just couldn't quite see how how that was tractable in the real world. Although, of course, it is. Um, but I, I liked the kind of applied aspect of materials, understanding you know how structures might deform uh, and where that's important, whether that be uh, in aerospace, automotive, uh, or the huge range of applications that there are for structural type materials. So, um, so, what, so with with Cambridge, uh, how does the materials department work? Is it do you do a focus on polymers, metals, composites, biomaterials? I mean, at MIT, it's kind of you get a little bit of everything, but probably less emphasis on metals, even though that's where the the whole uh, material science department started. Yeah, so uh, the, the the department is called material science and metallurgy. Um, but a lot like MIT, I think over the last sort of 30 years or so, a focus um, really has gone on to this, the massive range of things you might study under the banner of material science. So these days there is a biomaterials group. Um, there's a group, a group focused on uh, aerospace engines. 
um, but there's also a lot of devices uh, and polymers uh, and the like. So yeah, my undergraduate really did have a, that massive wide range, and I guess I, I didn't really know uh, at the time which one I would I would move into. Um, but what actually happened was um, in our fourth year, you do a research project. So uh, to give you a kind of flavour of what a research life might be like, um, you get to do um, your own self-contained little project. And one of my friends said to me. Um, okay, I did a project with this professor uh, and everyone in the class got uh, a first who did it with him and therefore uh, I applied only for his projects. Uh, and as it happens, that was my first uh, sort of entry into the world of indentation um, of, of metals, uh, studying creep processes. Uh, and as it happens, the professor was Professor Bill Klein, who is now our chief scientific officer uh, at Blastometrex. So that was was in 2014 uh, and we still work together on a, on a daily basis so I kind of uh, got down that track uh, focused on indentation around eight or nine years ago uh, and that's really you know that decision is what has led me to where where we are today. And so with uh, what was the the culture around entrepreneurship like when you were doing your undergrad did you have a I mean a direction that you wanted to take in terms of your career, more academic, kind of stay on the master's PhD track or go into teaching, go into industry, what, or start your own company like you're, like you're kind of doing now. Like what, was there pull from any one direction that early on? Uh, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't really specifically. Um, I, I don't want to say on uh, every step I fell into it by accident, but it, it might be what I end up uh, saying at a few key junctures. Um, yeah, during my undergraduate, I was just really uh, enjoyed material science. Um, there was, I wasn't really thinking about my future career. I think I'd always thought I might do a PhD. Um, and so that was always in the back of my mind. And and when I did this research project uh, in my final year, that was kind of when I realized, okay, I actually really enjoy this, this kind of thing. Maybe I should continue for another four years. Um, but there was no idea at that point of, could I, you know, for example, like you say, start, start the company or, or any real driver towards entrepreneurship. It was just, um, this looks like a really exciting area. I can see there are potential applications for um, the, whatever we might develop, and therefore I'm going to pursue that a, as part of a, a PhD program. And you know, as it happened, as we came towards the end of that um, program in 2018, um, we kind of had the bones of what we thought was a method that um, would you know, do what it says on the tin. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get into the details, but we, we came to the end of the, the PhD and we thought we had enough to potentially explore a commercial venture. So then um, we set about uh, that sort of separate journey. So, yeah, I, I think um, it, it, the timing was just very fortunate, I think, uh, on that front. And so can you talk a little bit about what your PhD was, what, what you were doing in terms of research and, and ultimately how it kind of connects to, to what you're doing now? Yeah, so uh, my PhD was titled Extraction of Inelastic Mechanical Properties from Indentation Data. So it, it really is sort of the, the foundation of what um, we now do uh, at Plastometrics. So um, extraction of uh, important plasticity properties, so that would be yield stress, uh, work hardening rates, uh, and ultimate tensile stress from just a simple uh, indentation uh, test. So um, towards the end of the PhD, I, we, we thought we'd completely cracked it. There were still some, some things to iron out, I guess. Um, but um, that's what really we developed using uh, inverse finite element analysis. Um, we could go from doing um, an indentation test, applying this uh, analysis, and then getting a prediction of uh, a stress strain curve. Uh, and during that time, we did a lot of that kind of fundamental work, um, looking at um, what, is, what are the sensitivities of the different outcomes to the things that we're interested in, which were, you know, yield stress and, and UTS. And we did a huge amount of validation testing where we took, you know, pretty standard materials where roll bar, uh, sheet, et cetera, uh, did tensile testing, but also did uh, indentation testing and use that to really um, build up our knowledge of, of not only what happens in the indentation test, but also in all the you know, standard sort of uniaxial tests that people do, whether that be tension, compression, um, et cetera. So just so for the people who may not be materials engineers with this, let me see if I can recap and you can correct me for what, uh, yeah. <laughs> for what I'm, I'm not getting right. So Typically for a materials test or like a mechanical test, you'd have some sort of rod or a tensile dog bone, they, they 
typically say you put it in a machine, it pulls it um, to get kind of the, the strength, the elongation, and you, you do that until failure. Oftentimes it, t- it takes a while. You got a machine, a, a, a coupon to do it. So it's not a trivial amount of work. Um, it's not hard, but it just takes time um, versus this, this approach or kind of what you're doing with your PhD. You're essentially taking a section of that material driving an indentation in it, like making a, a mark, making a hole or kind of a, uh, an imprint in it and kind of extract, extrapolating um, or, or predicting some of those similar mechanical properties. Is that fair? Yeah, that's absolutely, uh, you got it absolutely on the nail. So a um, few of the key benefits, if you like, would be that the test is really quick. So like you, like you said, although a tensile test in itself is is you know really quite quick the actual machining that goes into it can take we, we did a survey of around 500 different companies and, and lots of them were waiting more than a week just to get their results back um you know so if if we if we look at the additive angle if you're trying to do parameter development to get the best possible tensile properties so you've got a laser based system and you want to change whether it be layer uh, layer height hatch spacing laser power etc and you want to know, okay, how am I going to maximize my tensile properties? We well, don't want to have to wait a week once you've done your first print to be able to iteratively adjust those those properties. So with our test, you can very do a very quick test um, and get those exact same properties out of that. Um, so uh, yeah, it, small samples uh, and fast testing is one of the sort of key attributes of the of the technique. And you have. I did this years ago in terms of like, I remember some sort of indentation. So I'm ch- trying to r- rack my brain a little bit. So you, you, you have the option of using different indenters, right? Like the different geometries yeah. makes a difference in terms of what you can measure. And then I assume as well, you have the ability, the, the, well, there's differences between materials, like the likely limitations or what you can see, right? Cause you have, you do the indentation and then it's an optical a piece of data that you analyze is that right on um, like the specific test of how it works i see you have yeah, one in so, the back so yeah so uh <laughs> if, if anyone is on i guess on the youtube yeah. channel be able to yeah. see the machine behind me but what we have is a, is a spherical indenter so yeah. the reason uh, for using a sphere is uh, there's a couple of reasons so first of all when we model that test uh in finite element analysis we can use the symmetry uh of the sphere so we only need to use an axisymmetric model and that means that the model is much quicker than if you had to use a, a 3d um a 3d geometry um, and that has huge benefits in terms of um we have to run a huge number of these simulations and we have to run them quickly um so that's one huge benefit of a sphere the second is that um it's just a really <laughs> simple shape so um if you have a, a sort of a sharp indenter so for example a vickers or uh, a noop uh, or in, if anyone is familiar with nano indentation, you might use a Berkovich indenter. Now they all have sharp sides. So there's a problem there in the, how sharp is that face? And over time, as you keep using that indenter, does it become uh, less sharp or, or damaged in some way? And that, um, means that you have a little bit of an unknown when you're then trying to model, uh, the process. And then finally, the, a spherical indenter is great because uh, the, the ones that we use uh, effectively are ball bearings and they're cheap and widely available. So uh, again, unlike um, when you go down to super fine scale indentation, um, nano indentation type stuff, the, the tips can cost thousands of dollars. Um, we, can, we can supply um, replacements if they do become damaged for any reason um, for just a few hundred. So we use a spherical indenter. Um, so one millimeter radius is our typical size. And then once we've created that indent, we have, um, it's actually a stylus profiler. So um, it, that will come across um, during the test and it will scan the full shape of that indent. So you've got kind of a spherical part in the center, which of course has been made by the indenter. So we'll get kind of the depth of the indent and the shape of the interior. And then as you come out of the indent, there'll be uh, a pile up region. So um, because of the way that metals deform, and actually I probably should have mentioned this close to the start, we are looking almost exclusively at, at metallic materials. Um, because of the kind of fundamentals of you know um, plasticity and and how uh, that occurs in metals, so by either dislocation glide or by a twinning, you always conserve volume. 
And that means if you push down with the indenter, you have to push some material elsewhere to effectively conserve that volume. What that means is you get this region around the indent, which is called the pileup region. Uh, and depending on how much pileup there is, which we can measure fairly closely, that gives you a really good indicator of how much work hardening uh, the material is going to show. So if there's a, a low pileup height, you'll get a lower yield stress with more work hardening, which will mean eventually you'll have a big difference between yield and UTS. Um, or if you have a, a, a higher pileup height, low work hardening, and therefore a smaller difference between your yield uh, and UTS. So and uh, that's kind of the data that we need. We need the load that we've applied. We need that profile data. And then we put it into our, um, our inverse finite element analysis procedure. And that accurately then predicts um, those properties. So a lot of your research kind of doing your PhD was on how like compiling a bunch of this data and trying to make the the model that fits to do this rapidly or absolutely more, yeah. More so, yeah. So the, the, the first first couple of things you look at is um, okay, what do we want to predict? So we want to predict yield stress uh, and work hardening up till uh, an ultimate tensile strength. Um, and then the question is, okay, if we're going to do this by indentation, which is the best outcome for us to look at? So, uh, you know, worldwide, there's people doing a lot of research in the kind of area, and often they'll use the load displacement plot. So you measure um, during the test load and displacement of the indenter uh, into the specimen. So we spend uh, a lot of time looking at that same data set. Um, and at some point, uh, Bill, my supervisor at the time, said, um, you know, maybe we should have a look at the the effect of looking at the profile. So that shape that we we leave in the um, in the surface layer after we've done the indent. I said, okay, well, we've spent a lot of time looking at the low displacement curve, but okay, let's have a look at it. And it really was quite surprising. The sensitivity of that outcome, the residual profile, is so much stronger um, than. Uh, than the load displacement plot. Um, and that was kind of a surprising result. Um, and that was kind of one of the, the, the foundations that we've then built the, the company on was we're not going to use the load displacement data. Um, it's kind of difficult to acquire accurately. Um, and it just isn't that sensitive to the outcome that we're interested in. Um, and it was it was for, for that reason um, that we switched to, to measuring profile data. Um, and yeah, during my PhD, so we spent a lot of time deciding which which outcome was best to use. We fixed on um, the residual profile data, um, and you know we we published this in in scientific um, journals at the, at the time. Um, and then we kind of went about uh, as we sort of finished the kind of more research side into forming the company. We looked at then how do we build a machine that could actually automatically do all of this testing. So there was, you know, we kind of recognize there's a lot of people doing different kind of indents out there. But if we said to them, do this test and then find the surface profile um, and you can use our software maybe to, um, to you know, analyze that data, it would be um, very messy. You know, we'd be coming in with all different types of data that people would supply um, and it could have a significant uh, impact on the outcome. So we kind of realized early on. We're going to have to build this machine ourselves uh, and as a few material scientists set about trying to sort of conquer this engineering type problem which you know with a little bit of outside support we have we have done um and now we have what we think is quite a good looking machine and what was the early days of that uh that startup like what was the like did you were you funded by the university like did you have to extract like patents i don't know the ip structure of of cambridge or, or specifically in the U UK, but like what, what were, walk us through like some of those early, early foundation days of the, of the company. Yeah. So in the early days, uh, it was, I mean, it was really interesting. We, um, you know, we really were initially a founding team of four uh, and we had a lot of experience in the, in the kind of academic sphere. So um, really at that point, we had no very strong IP because we'd actually publish a lot of it in in the scientific literature, uh, and and to some extent that that policy of being fairly open with our uh, science and the sort of fundamentals of what we're doing has continued to some extent to to this day. So we still regularly publish um, because really we want to be upfront and and clear about the processes that we're employing and developing um, to make you know mechanical testing simpler uh, and easier. Um, there are, you know, there are competing techniques uh, out there that we think certainly is kind of um, 
a little bit of a black box. So to, to the extent that we can, we're trying to be as open scientifically uh, as possible. Um, so in the early days, yeah, we have to say we, we kind of felt like we'd solved to some extent the science. Um, and then it became, can we can we build this machine? And um, the one that you see behind me is is one that took uh, probably in total around two years. Um, but we started really with, um, we had, you know, a motor and we had, um uh, a couple of a couple of basically pieces of aluminium um all joined together by some uh some uh, at the time they were just lead screws um and you know it was a big step when we realized we could get the motor to move uh, the different parts up and down um and then we sort of moved on to trying to get the profilometry uh working which you know involved trying to source the correct profilometer that we thought was robust enough to use in the field uh, but also would give us the accuracy uh, and, and overall, it took around a year to bring all those components together. As I say, we did then have some support um, from an external um, company who do uh, engineering design. They're called Minima Design over here in the UK. Uh, and they helped us take it from what was um, a prototype um, that we still do have in the lab, but it doesn't look anything like the machine today, uh, up to you know something that could actually be manufactured for sale. Um, and, you know, we had some really, really funny moments over those that period where we took it to a trade show, for example, and um, we were just kind of trying to get a feel in the early days of, of how would it be received? You know, what would people think of it? Because it was completely new to a lot of people of a way of approaching mechanical testing. And, and this guy came up to us and he said, I really like what you're doing, but but is the machine dead? And we said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, wait, I can't tell if it's on or not. And we realized we just hadn't put a single light on the machine uh, to indicate that it, it was alive. And uh, in fact, the, the machine is off at the moment, but um, we now have status indicator lights front and center on the front of the machine that will tell you, is it on? Is it running? And are there any errors? So um, that was kind of, you know, just one of those moments where uh, a throwaway comment actually ended up in a complete change to the, the front of the machine and the, and the design. Um, and then to just touch on the, the sort of funding routes, um, we were sort of fortunate, I guess, at the time that um, someone uh, that uh, our CEO, James Dean, knew uh, was in the kind of venture space. Um, and they said, you know, come and talk to us. Uh, and they uh, were our initial funders um, for that kind of prototype development work. So for the first um, around two years of the business, um, they they funded us um, at first. And then um, at that point, we were starting to get a little bit more sort of awareness in, in the space. Uh, and we had a, a trial with Element Materials Technology, who a lot of people in the in the area will have heard of. They're a global testing inspection uh, and certification company. And uh, of course, they have been on the podcast. Um, and um, so we did technical trials with them with a view to uh, also investing in, in Plastometrex. And, and thankfully, uh, they did so. You know, the, the trials went well. Uh, and that relationship is, is really strong to this day so and so talk about the business model so you've got a machine that you 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 sell to customers i mean typically like if uh, last i checked to buy a tensile testing machine for metals it's somewhere in like the forty thousand dollar range and then you gotta get all the machining tools and all the software on on top of it so is is the idea to kind of sell the machine itself to to users and maybe the other piece of this i was really interested in your comment about kind of the 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 listening listening tour that you went on where you talked to you know four or five hundred companies and it takes a week to to get test results back is are most of these companies that you're working with do do testing internally or or externally or is it a kind of a mix yeah so um just first of all on on i guess our model so um won't give any specific numbers because we do we have different models for uh, for academics and, and industry but what where we've priced it is between um, a typical hardness tester and a sort of higher end tensile tester so as you said you you can pay forty thousand dollars for a tensile tester but you can also pay uh, pretty much whatever you want depending on uh, you know how, how many bells and whistles you'd like attached um, and it, it, when you add in the things like machining costs um, uh, and that kind of thing, you know, we come in quite a way under to get all those tools in-house. I say uh, we are probably more expensive than your kind of just low-end tensile tester, uh, sorry, hardness tester. Um, but that's because we think the information you can get out of our machine is way more valuable than you might get from a simple hardness test. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the kind of, 
uh, value that we build is really in the software. So, um, you know, the indent that we carry out and the scanning, um, that's kind of, you know, we, we've built that machine and it, and it does work. But all of the analysis uh, and a lot of the future developments will really be on uh, how can we improve the software. So to give you a, a flavor of that for the additive space, again, um, what we have at the moment is something that can predict accurately when the material properties are isotropic. So if you have a, a you know an isotropic metal uh, and you tensile test it in the different directions, you'll get pretty much the same result. Uh, and then when you use our machine, you'll get pretty much the same result. If the material is anisotropic, the, the, it becomes a much more complex problem. Um, and of course, when you print a metal, at least in the sort of as-built state, you often have anisotropy uh, that is there. So um, what we can do is we can detect really quite sensitively that anisotropy. Um, so what we do for that is we do scans in different directions uh, in the indents. We might scan sort of left to right on the machine or forwards to backwards. And if those two directions have different properties, we'll see a change in that pileup height that we talked about a little earlier. So um, what that means is we can sensitively pick it up, but at the moment we can't yet predict uh, any um, differences in those different directions because that requires a 3D model and a much more complex set of analysis. But uh, I, recently, uh, I've been awarded a, a UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship by the UK government, um, and that project is completely aimed at uh, extraction of anisotropic mechanical properties from, from indentation data. So hopefully, you know, should that project, and that is very much a research and development project, be successful, uh, we're really hoping then that we can improve the software and give the current customers, you know, access to that. Um, so, you know, all of the developments we're hoping will be very sort of software, software centric. Um, and then to address the second question about the, um, the companies that we surveyed, um, it's a total mix of people doing in-house testing or outsourcing to places like Element to get their testing done for them. And it, it I say the the kind of the upshot of the um, the questions that we asked was like on average it takes about a week for them to get their results, but some people were waiting up to six weeks just to get one data set. Um, and so you know um, that's where the the real value of having a machine like ours, where you can just get those numbers so quickly, really comes in for for these companies. And so I've got a little density 3d printed cube right here um, yeah. for those who are, are listening made of aluminum. So when like specifically the additive, right, you've got this challenge, you kind of hinted on it with anisotropy because you're building layer on layer and the part is oriented in different directions, even if you're, you're, um, you're testing in one. So like when, when you were to, if you were to do something like this, like kind of indented or, or get a, a tensile coupon or something like that, do you have to be pretty careful of what like understanding which direction that it was built in and so like if it was built kind of like this you want, want, may want to do it like this but if you rotated it 90 degrees you'd have, get kind of a completely different result or potentially a different result is that yeah, a, for a sure. big, so the, big characteristic you need to, to track yeah so there's there's two i guess really important things that are uh, uh, about additive and the first one is anisotropy and the second one is uh, if the structure is homogeneous or not so uh, if we touch on the anisotropy one first so if you have a material that you've built up um if you do an indent along the build direction um so if you imagine you've built up the part you're kind of indenting on the top of it um then we would expect in the vast majority of cases for that to give us a radially symmetric indent. So, uh, i.e. that the properties are the same in all of those uh, in-plane directions, if you like. And that's because where, where you often see the differences is not in the XY plane. So you'd expect the properties if you did like an X bar or an XY bar to be pretty similar. The differences we really see are when you're looking at the plane that contains the build direction. So if you took that part like you've got there and then rotated 90 degrees and did an indent in either the, the XZ or the YZ plane, where you often get things like directional growth uh, or strong uh, crystallographic texture, that's where you can start to see these uh, non radially symmetric indents which give us a red flag to say okay there's a difference in the properties here between for example the build and the transverse directions um and you know if we spin that the other way we've got a really quick way of assessing if anisotropy is present in a material so you could take your density cube there 
and you could do an indent on the top surface uh, containing those uh, X, Y planes, you could get a prediction of the properties. And okay, that's going to be, if you like, averaged over all directions. You could then flip that material and you could get a really quick sense of, is this material strongly anisotropic or not? And at the moment, you know, we, we can give you an indication of, of how strong the anisotropy is, um, but we can't sort of quantitatively do it. And that's where, that's where we're working towards um, in the future. But even now, that's quite powerful to be able to, say, uh, inform what tensile testing you might do or what heat treatment you might apply, um, et cetera. Um, so the other thing about additive, and this is, a, um, this is, again, one of those things that is a bit of an issue in terms of the materials, but also a benefit of using a technique where you're probing sort of single points. Um, you know, with your typical tensile test, you're talking uh, tens of millimeters of material uh, that you need to pull on and you'll end up with one tensile test result, right? Um, you just get one yield stress and one ultimate tensile strength. And that's that's it. You're not given any information about do the properties vary over that bar, um, which, you know, if your process is uh, like additive, where there can be some um, differences in the different locations of the, the build plate, for example, um, you couldn't always be sure that the whole structure is, is homogeneous. And using our technique, you can then do more of a map over the whole uh, the whole build plate and see, okay, are my you know are my properties in these different locations that I'm printing always the same? Uh, and what we found a lot of the time is that they're not. You know, these different regions will have been through different thermomechanical cycles, and that will lead to differences in the material properties. And. How do you see people using your product at the moment? I mean, kind of the gold standard for testing is is, is tensile for the most part, and yeah. an additive. Are people using this more for kind of pre-production R and D development work to get kind of get those parameters, or um, as it matures and you kind of get on a path towards, hey, this could be a substitute, or this could be rapid inline qualification of like day-to-day -day parts, like where, where do you kind of fit at the moment and where's the industry in terms of being receptive to using this as a, a, a substitute versus a, a partner? Yeah, that is, that is a great question. So, uh, you know, we are still a new technology. Uh, the company was founded around four years ago. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of pace of change, uh, unsurprisingly, is fairly slow when you've got something that's, that's new to market, effectively, you know, unproven for, for other people out there. So, um, it, yeah, at, at the moment, we kind of are in a lot of research and development uh, areas. So uh, if people are trying to do new alloy development, for example, um, so uh, we've got machines over here in, in Oxford University in the UK uh, and also research institutions uh, in the US, such as uh, the Worcester Polytechnic Institute, who are using the machine a lot in kind of alloy development spaces um, just to try and much more quickly get to a point where they can say, OK, yes, we've now made the mechanical properties, you know, at the level we actually need them to be for whatever the application is. Um, and again, on the more industrial side, um, we also have customers using it uh, in, a, in a more research environment. But sort of exciting for us, we also do have a couple of customers who are now really trying to push it into that more quality control type space. So you know, they've had the machine for a, a year or two, and now they're familiar with it, how it works, and they want to try and get it to, can we use this machine um, to do quality control and either replace some of the tensile testing that we're doing or supplement that tensile testing. So, you know, uh, a, a sort of metal production companies, for example, can say to their customers, not only have we done all the tensile tests that you require on this material, we've also gone above and beyond to make sure that, um, you know, every 10 minutes that the material is coming off the line, the properties that we've checked, they're exactly the same um, as they were when we took the tensile every, say, 12 hours. Um, and that's, you know, where we want the technology to go um, from, you know, at the moment, R&D heavy, but heading towards um, that kind of QC, QA uh, environment. And how do you know with, uh, like, going back to additive, right? Like, there is, uh, there's a, certainly differences across the surface, right? There could be inclusions, there could be um, defects. And so as you're indenting, um, it's the same thing with a mechanical test, right? Like if you hit an inclusion in that one spot, you're going to get a different um, different value. But is there, like, do you, when you do a scan of like a top surface of a density cube, would you do multiple indents and kind of average those out? Or is it 
kind of one and done in terms of like how you scan it to get like a, a good representative understanding of, hey, I'm not hitting a defect and this is going to be 25% less than what it actually should be. Yeah, that's a, a really good question. There's kind of two aspects, I guess, to it. So the first one is um, the scale on which we're doing the indent. And then the second is the effect of defects um, on the different kind of tests. So if I address the first one, um, we're doing a fairly large indent. So um, the typical indent is like one millimeter uh, diameter. So the idea there is, is that we want to make sure we capture all the aspects of the microstructure that actually give the material its bulk mechanical properties. So um, that's why we indent on a, a fairly large scale. Um, it does mean there are some limitations. So if you have really large grain sizes of several millimeters, for example, we're not going to be able to indent several grains. And therefore, we don't recommend using the machine on, on those you know, very large grained materials. But, you know, for a typical grain size of maybe, uh, you know, 20 to 100 microns, let's say, we're always going to capture a large number of, of grains. So um, what we often do is just do a single indent in a, in a surface um, and say, you know, we've made sure we captured all the microstructural features in that surface that would lead to the bulk properties you would get if you were to do a tensile uh, in that same region. So um, if you wanted to do, for example, uh, a study on how homogenous my material is, then you could do, um, you know, 5, 10, uh, 50 indents in the same surface. Uh, and that is another application where, again, for AM, it's particularly relevant because you might be genuinely concerned about some, some variations uh, in space. And the other one is, is on a particular defect or inclusion. And that, so that manifests itself in different ways uh, depending on the, the test. So for example, a tensile test, if you have a defect in there, you might expect therefore the material might fracture early during the test. So we call that here at Plastometrex premature fracture. So fracture that occurs before the material has gone to its sort of usual uh, ultimate tensile strength, which would be when it would begin to neck. So, you know, if taking an extreme example, if you have a, a very large defect in the center of your tensile bar, you might pull on it and it may never even yield. It'll just elastically deform and then, and then snap. Now, during an indentation test, the story is slightly different because we've got a mainly compressive stress field, mainly underneath that indenter. And therefore, um, we're actually, instead of, you know, uh, instead of expanding that defect and, and possibly cracking the material like you might do in tension, we're going to close up the defect. Um, and what that means is very small defects won't have much effect on the, the end result because we simply close up the you know, micron scale defect. But with our fairly large indenter, we won't see much of an effect um, in the final result. But what that also means is we don't get any information about a fracture event from our test. So we have to be super clear with customers and potential customers that um, if the material does fracture during a tensile test, then we're not going to pick up that information. So we're going to predict the UTS on the basis that the material goes to a necking point um, rather than any kind of fracture event that might occur you know, when you do a tensile. So how have you found the culture of additive manufacturing companies? I mean, they're, they're already kind of on the path of looking at some newer advanced manufacturing technologies, but often with that comes the higher ups, the standard organization are going to be demanding that, hey, you got to prove it to us that this material, this process is valid, it's repeatable. And so they kind of default to some of the standard mechanical and materials testing. So how have you found, kind of navigated that through through your company and looking at kind of bringing some new new approaches that could accelerate this process to to the market? Yeah, so that's a question we get asked uh, quite a lot uh, in our live demos. What we do for people, they'll say, "Okay, but is the is it standardized?" Uh, and the the answer is, we're working on it. So um, this is again why the technique kind of falls at the moment more in the R and D side is because you know if you are doing product release testing, for example, uh, what customers will often want to see is a, is a tick saying, yes, we've uh, done this testing to this particular standard, and therefore we can say absolutely for certain that, um, you know, the properties are what we say they are. So um, that's why kind of we still sit in the kind of R&D space because we don't yet have that dedicated standard. Um, however, it comes at kind of an ideal time for us that, you know, 
uh, ASTM and, and the, the Center of Excellence are working to really accelerate standards in the additive space. Um, so, you know, there's a huge amount of activity at the moment on um, standardizing a whole range of different additive processes. Uh, and that provides us with an opportunity to try and also accelerate uh, a standard in, in our space as well. So we're talking with uh, ASTM at the moment, uh, and I hope to be able to, to make some progress on that over the next sort of year or so um, towards a sort of standard for for the technique. Oh, awesome. But it. But in terms of, yeah, in terms of reception, I guess, from from uh, different additive companies, um, it can be pretty varied. Um, so some people say, OK, we're, we're not going to worry too much about that because we're also doing process development. And if you can accelerate that by, you know, two or three times, because we don't have to get every, you know, we don't have to get a thousand tensile bars made. We can just do a thousand of your tests. And then maybe at the end, we'll do 10 tensile bars of the best, uh, you know, our best guesses at which ones are appropriate um then it will speed up the process uh, a lot others say uh, quite simply you know if you haven't got a standard yet then we're not too interested come come back and speak to us when you've got one you know which i i, I can understand that sort of point of view uh, as well and what would be like kind of the time different or time savings that you'd have versus a tensile a standard tensile test in, in your mission yeah so if we take that sort of example we used of like a week for doing just the machining and then uh, you know just a, a few hours to get the, the test result um with uh, our technique you can simply uh, mount the, the material got an example here in a standard bit of baker light um and do an indent in the top surface uh, and that process you know for a technician might take a uh, half an hour 45 minutes um the test itself only takes or well, it's less than five minutes to go from clicking the start button, if you like, to to the final result. So um, th that's, I guess, another, the value proposition there is really just, yeah, that time saving to be able to free up either technicians time to do other things, or to be able to move your process development on where you might have just been paused for like a, you know, a week or two waiting for results to come back. For sure. And you mentioned ASTM a little bit, and uh, you're going to be at the ASTM ICAM conference, but kind of where else can people find out more information about what you're doing, maybe meet you and the team in person? Yeah, so I'll be uh, yeah in Florida in October for the ICAM conference uh, and also at TMS next year in the US in, in San Diego. Um, but I guess I, I have to confess that I've used your podcast, Mike, to speak to a lot of people in the uh, the additive space. So, and I've had a lot of really good conversations with with people who you've had on the podcast previously. So if anyone has any questions, they want to just hear a bit more about the machine, if they want to uh, do a trial testing on their own material, for example, um, just get in contact with me uh, on LinkedIn uh, and I, I'll happily set that up. Um, so um, contact me on there for... for uh, any sort of uh, inquiry um, and I'll be in person in the U S a couple of times next year as well. And will you be at form next as well? Uh, I'm not at the moment planning on being at form next, but um, I, my plans might change. So there's the problem is with the additive space. There are so many different conferences. So we have yeah. TCT uh, over here in the yeah. UK, which is just after TCT in the U S um, but uh, yeah, so the, I've got a very busy schedule if I attended all of them, I guess. Um, but yeah, so we'll see. We'll see what the next year brings. Fantastic, Jimmy. Well, I really appreciate you being on the, on the show today. Awesome work and uh, look forward to seeing you and all the progress you guys are making. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Mike.